Welcome to Drinks Coach. Is this 150th? Got to be close. Um, hasn't been one for a couple of weeks. I'm actually doing some work for a living, having to go to an office. Uh, been rather busy, and my poor wife broke her foot. Uh, totally unrelated, but uh, thought I'd mention it anyway. Uh, sorry if you've been craving a few um, uh, drinks coaches, but here's a couple that I could have uh, whipped up. Uh, hopefully there'll be some more next week. Um, yeah. Uh, Vine sack or lowercase, or all lowercase drinks coach UK. Uh, actually, the UK isn't all lowercase. I've never ever said that before. Okay, so you are watching YouTube and you're watching the Drinks Coach UK, and I am Joe Wadsack. Please hit the subscribe button. Uh, I'd love to have some more subscribers. By May, it'll be two years since lockdown really hit, and I thought, what the hell am I going to do with my life? And started some totally unfocused, um, unkempt, unrefined tragic rant at the TV and you're watching episode 100 and so anyway uh yeah today this is a really cool one uh and I want to thank very much one of the people that I've been involved with working um and it was a complete happenstance but um I've been working for my dear friend Clemence uh, a PR agency in southwest London and uh, one of their um, clients is these guys so yes I guess in a way I'm sort of promoting them but I'm not getting paid to be promoting them uh, this is a show about training and education. And this is welcome to episode one of what the fuck's that on the back bar? OK, so this is um, a, an opportunity to uh, for me to show you what those drinks at the, on the back bar that you stare at while um, the guy's talking to his girlfriend rather than making your drink in an expensive bar, wherever you may be. Um, and you go, oh, God, what's that? that? That's an amazing colour. Do they still use that? Um, so uh, at the same time, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. Um, of this wonderful brand, Jafar, um, because they've given me all these liqueurs to to do the training with, and I haven't had to pay for any of them. So thank you, mate, thank you very much for that, and I think you should all thank them as well, uh, because you'll get the benefit of their wonderful quality products. Um, I'm not saying they're the best in the world. Um, there are one or two fantastic liqueur producers, and for for the sake of of of, um, of balance. Um, there's uh, Briotte, very good quality. There is Gabriel Boudier, very high quality. Uh, there's Amazing Value, Cassis from Vedren. Um, there are many other producers out there. Um, but Jivar has, just because I know more about them now, about 60 alcoholic liqueurs in their range and 90 syrups. Incredible range. Uh, they do some very interesting products uh, in just in the spirit of inspiration, try and inspire baristas and bartenders to come up with interesting and excitable drinks. So where did it all start? This is a company, Giffard, not Giffar, by the way. So it's G-I-F-F-A-R-D. There we go. Uh, and this is a bottle of Mariscal. We should come on to that then. Uh, the idea of what the is on the back of the back bar is that I thought I'd actually make some drinks for you and show you they can be done at home with some pretty ersatz equipment. Um, I have, didn't really think this that, that hard through because if I'm making a drink for myself, I don't. And uh, sometimes I'll use the wrong glass, but I'll try and use a glass which, which does the trick. Uh, you can get glasses woefully wrong and it will ruin the drink in many ways. Um, but what I'm doing today is making you four classic, absolute classic cocktails. Um, and uh, some of them more modern than others. Uh, but we're going to start off um, with a pretty old school one as far as cocktails are concerned. But we're going to talk about the story of Jafar first. This is the drink without which this incredible company, which is in every bar, virtually every cocktail bar on earth, uh, if not in every one, I'd be amazed. Um, but this is a drink called Jafar Mont Pastille. Mont Pastille. Um, around like, the late Victorian period, uh, mints were seen to be extremely good. I obviously didn't know as much about science as I do now, but largely been borne out to be true. The mints are, mints are very, very good. Um, blood coolant is very good at, at, at uh, uh, cleaning the blood. It's also very good for your stomach. It's very good for settling uh, things, hence people having extra strong mints and so forth. Obviously great for your breath. <laughs> um, so this drink was named um, after the very popular little Little, little metal tins of tiny little... You can imagine a polo, right? A polo mint or a lifesaver for you Americans out there. Um, the hole that's punched out of the middle, if you took that bit and kept all of those little tiny little pastels, there would be what we would laughingly call a peppermint pastel. 
And Mont Pastille is French for peppermint pastel. And it was named after them because it tastes incredibly like them. Um, now, okay, mint's not always the most popular thing. And also when we think about liqueurs, uh, we think of creme de menthe, we think of a green one. They do indeed make a green one because people demand it for certain drinks. Um, but not always that useful. Um, if you have a creme de menthe frappe, certainly when I was in my uh, teens in the 80s serving drinks for my parents uh, in our restaurant, uh, people would sometimes offer, ask, oh, can I have a creme de menthe frappe at the end of their meal with their coffee? Um, because they, it was a stomach settler, it was sweet, but also it wasn't particularly good quality uh, in most cases. But this stuff, man. So I think it was Emile Giffard in uh, 1885, uh, having born in the 40s, I think, 1840s, um, in a place called Angers, in the Loire, so on the Loire, sort of near Nantes, so kind of Brittany just, um, uh, I think, Is it Normandy, I don't know, I don't know, but it's on the Loire anyway, and um, he was a, uh, a chemist, a qualified chemist, and this is at, at a time when I'm sure if you can put yourself in their shoes, in the 1850s, you didn't have refrigerators, you didn't have ice in general so uh in order to get things cold you had to go you had to be quite innovative and quite clever about how you kept things cool but most things weren't any colder than pantry cold and uh sometimes they'd buy a block of ice to put in a thing to cool things down but you, the ice had to be made elsewhere uh, by people who knew how to make it and uh what would cool people down and what was very very good for the stomach was mint peppermint and uh, Mrs. Giffard was trying to um, create a stomach settler, something that would make his uh, particular pharmacy, his particular chemist, popular in Angers, in the city. And right next to them was the Grand Hotel of Angers, where the local bar, a very fancy bar, um, the guy heard about what he was doing and came in and said, I want to try this on my customers. This was in 1885. And 1885 was a barnstorming Martian hot I don't know if Martian, Martian is hot Venus hot summer it was one of the hottest summers on record people were <laughs> fainting uh, and he said can I just try this on my guests we, I can pour them a cool glass of water with a shot of uh, your mint concoction uh, your mint remedy uh, maybe we can uh, uh, make this into a drink that's successful anyway it was unbelievably successful an overnight national success just went bonkers and from that moment on Emil Giffard was no longer a chemist but a liquorist making tinctures and making lovely delicious drinks and um we've got on all those years now now we're looking on at uh what's it 1885 about 140 years 137 yes um and uh the family is still making all these products and the Giffard family are still making these most extraordinary drinks and uh, very, very high quality. Look, they're not the only people that make these liqueurs. There are other people that make the same flavoured liqueurs, um, but uh, they're pretty good. I mean, they're pretty amazing, actually. And there's different levels. If I show you the packaging, we've got Montpasti, which almost stands on its own. This is a wonderfully kind of uh, retro package, but doesn't that even, even hold it? Even looking at it makes me feel less hot. It's, Lovely and cool, and there's a breezy and refreshing about it. There's a great story behind that. Then we've got the range of liqueurs, which is, this is a Mariscal, this is a Violette. For those people who know their cocktails will probably know what I'm going to make at the end of the show. But one's got Maraschino liqueur in it, which is a sour cherry from Italy. Um, and this is uh, Giffard, made from violet flowers. Um, I was extremely pleased to find out that um, my sense of smell has completely come back after COVID. The one thing that did, I couldn't smell was violets. Um, I could eat a packet of Parma Violet sweets, you know, the purple sweets. Some people think they're disgusting, taste like soap. And they just tasted like uh, caster sugar, icing sugar. And I smelt this this week and it just reeked of violets. I went, oh, hallelujah. My violet sense of smell has come back. So that's pretty complete. I'm pretty sure that we're back to at least 99% of my sense of smell before I got COVID twice. Okay, so... What we're talking about, yes, we're talking about Mont Pasty. So Emil Giffard made this drink. What made it very special was he'd isolated after experimenting with loads and loads of different species, species wrong, varieties of mint. And they found a variety of mint which was absolutely astonishing that nobody had seen purity of like it. And he started to propagate it. In fact, there are fields um, which, people, which the Giffard family um, paid to make under contract. And I don't know if they, I think they have their own fields as well. Um, and it's called Black Mitcham Mint. Now, uh, I live here in Wandsworth, on Wandsworth Common, uh, about four miles away from Mitcham. The same, very same Mitcham 
that this mint's named after. During Victorian times, obviously this part of London, South London, wasn't nearly as um, as built up as it is now. And uh, people used to go to Mitcham to take in the air. <laughs> they used to walk through the meadows where there was lavender and peppermint. And they had these bronze peppermint leaves which were extraordinary in their fragrance. And then people would feel a lot better and then come back. Now, I don't know if you've been to Mitcham recently, but if you try to do the same thing, all you'd be able to smell is dirty chicken and McDonald's um, at best um, if you're not busy not trying to break your ankles on all the little miniature nitrous oxide canisters you'll find everywhere um, Mitchum has its upsides and its downsides but um, a meadow of purity it is not but they still have this mint and they still make Mont Pasty the same way exactly the same way he did in his glass laboratory in Angers in the back of the chemist all those years ago What's it like? Well, I've got a glass just so we can taste it. And it's um, it's second to none. If you like mint, even if you don't like mint, you sort of think if you like mint, you think, oh, well, you know, just, just look at things that are sickly. It's far from sickly. It's the most delicious thing. It's very, 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 very clean. You can look at that. It looks like just like thick water, really. It just pervades the senses with the most clean white mint power um it smells like opening a fresh packet of extra strong mints and going it's that smell it's extraordinary extraordinary um and it's got that slightly menthol quality which actually has already cleared my sinuses a little bit i don't know if they needed cleaning but now i suddenly smell smell clearer than i did before it's ref it's genuinely refreshing now it's generally refreshing, although it's made from concentrated, refined sugar from sugar beet in North France and uh, sugar beet fields in Brittany. Um, how can it be refreshing when it's 24% alcohol and it's got sort of 150 grams per litre of sugar in it? I don't know, but this is one of the great, great drinks to come out of France. It, it's, it's a part of the French identity in the same way that Perno and Ricard and Pasties are, I think. When I first went to France to work, when I was studying winemaking, I was going back to about 1991, somebody offered me a job in a bar, and I said, yeah, I could take the job. He said, you do speak French, don't you? I said, oh, yes. I mean, how hard could it be? I mean, un bière, de vin, whatever. Well, it's not that simple. Um, they have all sorts of drinks. There's a panache, which is a, um, a shandy. You've got a perroquet, which is a shandy with grenadine juice added to it and if you just add water and ice to creme de menthe it's called a diable menthe so a uh, diable pastille is one of these with water and ice and it's absolutely refreshing delicious so what drink am i going to make with this well i didn't have any weapons grade cognac in the house unfortunately uh christmas is over sadly um what I do have, though, is this, which I've been dying to talk about for a long time. Um, I can't remember where I got it from. Oh, yes, I got it from Vida, actually. Um, Vida's a new kid on the block. Great um, mail-order company. Um, you can also get this, I'm pretty certain, get this at um, Whiskey Exchange because they're, you know, very uh, discerning. And this is a fantastic product. Asbach Uralt is a three-year-old brandy which you can find all over Germany. And if you go out for dinner and somebody's kind of kind and wants to give you a little digestif with your coffee, like, oh, would you like a little brandy with me? It would almost, almost certainly be Asbach Uralt. Um, then the International Wine and Spirit Competition is well over 10 years ago now, I think. But I think it was when I won Communicator of the Year. International Wine Communicator of the Year, which I have won twice um <laughs> it's the only chance to get a chance to glow about anything it's like the only thing i've ever won really um but it was an international award i feel very proud of it um but hugo asbach who is the um this the owner and stiller of this uh, brandy makes an eight-year-old this is an eight-year-old so it's kind of somewhere between a very special old pale which is a vsop or an xo which would be around 12 years old this is truly truly delicious brandy and you know on this show if you've been following it you'll know that i'm a big fan of brandy when it's good and it doesn't have to be cognac I'm not knocking cognac. Please don't think that. And you cognac guys out there, feel free to send me anything new and interesting. Uh, there's some fantastic drinks in cognac. All I'm saying is, it's not the only product in the same way. I'm very, very man, a very strong force for reason when it comes to champagne and English sparkling. There are loads of other good sparkling wines out there which aren't being talked about. So, what does this make? This makes Billy Holiday's favourite drink. Billy Holiday as far as we can tell, pretty much died 
drinking these. She was a soak. Uh, we know that. We know she was a depressive alcoholic. Um, but it was in her rider going to places like Madison Square Gardens that there can't be any cognac and Montpasti on premise so that she couldn't make one of the great 1920s cocktails, which is a stinger. So I'm going to make you a stinger. It's very, very simple to make. Uh, and you think, what, what would that taste like? Um, or maybe you're thinking, blimey, of course that would taste delicious. I mean, why wouldn't it be? Why, why didn't I do that myself? So here's a little martini mixing uh, glass. Uh, what we're going to do is going to take some asbach. I've got all sorts of jiggers here. You know, everyone's got them in their house. Um, what you need to do, really, is go to a little shop like Robert Dice or something like that and get a couple of these. These were given to me at Christmas in a little cracker, or virtually, or in a stocking. And they're absolutely fantastic. These are really cool little measurements, so you can get your measurements exactly right. A lot of trouble went into making some of these cocktails, um, sometimes 100 years ago, and they're made to very precise um, tolerances. Um, and if you muck them up, the drink just won't taste right. And sometimes we, I've had people say, oh, I had that drink, it was rubbish. I said, well, did you measure out exactly? And they're like, oh, that's what I used. It. I just did it by eye. I said, well, more for you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is make this drink out of, I'm not going to use this anyway, um, two ounces of brandy. This is Asperger 80, 80 ounce. Normally I'd use probably use a Cavazia VS, a uh, very mixable, very good quality cognac. Uh, the most popular cognac in the world. I, mean, I think 65% of the entire cognac industry is now Hennessy. Um, not knocking them either, but there's plenty of other choices. And, you know, I, I do like to sometimes buy the product from the underdog. I think um, they all deserve a chance, don't they? Especially during lockdown and everything. So this is Montpasti. So what we're going to do is now add to two ounces of cognac, three quarters of an ounce of Montpasti. There we go. That's three quarters of an ounce. There we go. And then all we need to do now... Give it a cheeky stir. So the stirring, because if I shook it, it would fragment the ice and it would break down the ice more quickly. Sure, it'd be cold initially, colder, um, but the fractionation of the ice will cause more dilution. Um, and just it's not as pretty a drink either. If you, if you carefully stir this down, it'll get plenty cold enough. It'll get down to minus 10 or whatever if the ice is fresh. Um, and uh, you won't have all these fragmentations of, of ice. You won't need to double strain it. Anything, but there we go. I'm pouring this. It's a lovely colour. It's a golden sort of colour. Which glass should I use for this? Mm, good question. Uh, I think we use this one. Why not? A martini glass. Um, this thing would have been served with a coupe, probably. Uh, I do know people who drink um, stingers on the rocks. I quite like it like that. I like the dilution, but here we go. There's my beautiful bar spoon. Thank you very much again to Elix and Absolute for giving me this bar set last year. I think it was around the time of Father's Day and I was trying to promote it, but it was very difficult because of lockdown and everything. Um, but you can buy this set if you go to Absolute Vodka to Elix on the website. It's a beautiful, um, designed, well-made, professional-grade um, uh, martini mixing kit. About £100, but they're very, very good. One of my treats of last year. There we go. Okay, so that's it. That is a stinger, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think Bing Crosby, I think it was Bing Crosby, he used to drink a lot of these. Bob, 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 Bing. Um, when asked, why is it called a stinger? And it's because it takes the sting out of life. That's really the idea behind it. It's got a wonderful kind of sheen to it. Hmm. <laughs> it's just so strangely good. You've got to get the balance right. Too much creme de menthe and it just tastes sweet and a bit bleh. Too much cognac and you can just taste the woodiness and it's a bit awkward. You get it just right. And it tastes like mint toffee. Absolutely delicious. Where are we going from here then? Okay. Oh yes, we carry on the Giffard story. So Montpastie was the beginning and the sort of like the engine house behind the success of Giffard as a family. Um, we have these two levels now. If you look at the different bottles we've got here. These, these are for their sort of premium super liqueurs, um, which have a slightly posher packaging. In generally speaking, they'd be over 20 pounds, between 21 and 24 pounds, uh, where the majority of these normal back bar bottles would be between 16 and 20. That's a very, very loose thing. And there's, they all have different prices depending on the cost of the ingredients, but all made the same way. All made by adding maybe a special, uh, 
addition possibly of an eau de vie, maybe some agricole rum, um, or they just use pure alcohol and they steep the fruit or whatever in it uh, under conditions in order to extract as much flavour as they can. And that might take three or four days for a herbal cure. It might take three or four months for certain fruits or nuts. And then they take it off at the optimum time. And it, take, it means a lot of tasting, a lot of skill. Um, so uh, the next drink I'm going to make um, is a drink made, invented by a chap called Keith McNulty. Um, it was an absolute banger in the 80s. Everyone was drinking sweets, coloured drinks. Um, and Keith McNulty, I think he was rather kind of gauchely described as the man that invented downtown in New York and is famous as a restaurateur, uh, had a lot of failures and some huge successes. The most giant success, probably, of his Manhattan cocktail um, a restaurant group was Balthazar. Um, Eamon, Manson, if you're watching this, my friend Eamon tried to open a restaurant in uh, Fulham called Balthazar and then had this massive cease and desist slapped on him by Keith McNulty across New York, at which point we suddenly found out he was going to open a Balthazar in London. And you can go to Balthazar. And when it opened, it was the place to be seen. Uh, it's just outside Covent Garden Market. Um, what's it like? Um, do you really want to know? OK, it looks like, and is slightly better than, Café Rouge. Sorry, sorry, Keith. Look, count the count the money. You're a much more successful businessman than I am, but it really isn't all that. Um, I think it's a bit like when um, apparently when they built uh, Euro Disney, Walt Disney came over and said well, they built this of castle and everything, and people came over and said it's all plastic and it's it's just a little false. I said yeah, but they're plastic in America too. I said yeah, 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 but this is France. They've got real castles here. They know what a castle looks like. Okay, so if you're going to make a castle, make it out of stone. So I have to take it all down and rebuild it. And in Japan, it's made out of marble. It looks like Magic Picture. It's incredible. Um, but um, what's my point here? Well, if you're going to get something right, do it properly. And if you're going to do a French bistro in London, um, you have to be aware there are actually French bistros already in London are doing a much better job. Um, so uh, after all of that slight ranting and been carrying about uh, Mr. McNulty, uh, congratulations on being a mega success of what you do. Uh, I certainly not. Um, what drink did he invent? Well, he invented a drink called the French Martini. It's been made in lots of different guises, uh, and it was a drink that really, really suited the 80s. It was very much a zeitgeisty drink of the time, and it requires um, ice. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm just going to strain it off. And um, it requires vodka. You can use Kettle One, which would have been the most popular, trendy uh, vodka of the time, possibly uh, Grey Goose. Um, Pineapple juice. Man, Man from Del Monte, he said yes. Anything more 80s than Man from Del Monte? I don't think so. Um, and we're going to use this. What they would normally use to make a French martini is about 40 mils, a little bit more maybe than 40 mils of vodka. Uh, then you use um, 20 mils, which is slightly less than half a restaurant measure, um, of a liqueur. Uh, and in this case, um, it would normally be Chambord. And Chambord comes in that beautiful kind of scepter, sort of orb, you know, orb and scepter orb, with like, almost looks like a crown. And you can buy the stuff in smaller bottles now to make French martinis in Sainsbury's and anywhere else. And it comes in a smashing little bottle. The product is actually very, very high quality indeed. And it's made from, I believe, Japanese black raspberries. So it looks like black clam, it actually tastes like raspberries. And it's got a lovely tartness to it, which makes it um, less easy to make the drink too sickly. Um, but is it the best on the market? Probably not. I know people that have given me a French martini with creme de cassis in it. I mean, it can work, but, you know, you've got to stop at some point. Or creme de meur, which is uh, which is something I might use in another show. I've got some of them from here, uh, which is the um, the float in a great drink called Bramble, invented by Dick Bradsell. It's just a delicious, refreshing, very fast to make cocktail. Um, but what we're going to use is this. I think this is the best product for making French martinis. And it's Giffard. Premium, you see that? It says premium. Framboise de Rance. Framboise de Rance is uh, an English or Scottish, judging by the name, let's call it Scottish, tabery. Now, a tabery is a raspberry that was crossed with a bramble or an English blackberry, and they end up as long, very pale blue kind of raspberries. They have the most fantastic flavour, and I'm just going to prove that now by making us a rather dashing French martini. So, French martini... So it goes. Got fresh ice. Should have brought a tea strainer so I can strain out the ice, but I've forgotten that. Okay, so let's go. 
Let's get this just right. So that's um, 40 mils. The most important thing about this drink is that you shake it hard. So the pectin and the pineapple gives you a slight creamy froth, um, which is lovely. So without the need of egg whites, you get a lovely texture to the drink. Um, okay, then. Let's put in 20 mils of from Ross. There we go. Then ooh, 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 ooh. about sixty mils of pineapple juice. Um, of course, fresh pineapple juice far far better. Um, I think people's tastes since the eighties have got less sweet. I think that's fair to say. Um, so I quite like it with a tiny kick of lime. There we go. Ah, that's my cold shake shaker here with Now, shake it like you mean it. There we go. Good hard shake is required. There we go. Just a hawthorn straight here today. Uh, typical garnish would be a wedge of pineapple. As you can see, I don't have any of those. But you can see the nice creaminess to it. This is the point. You've got a kind of like a, a whiskey sour texture for the drink. So, was he a genius? Well, I think he's got some things right. And this is a, a very popular drink indeed. You can mess around with the, um, the proportions. Um, a very, very talented guy, prolific. Producer, writer, um, book historian, I guess. A guy called Simon Difford has made a drink like this called a very French martini where he pulls out the vodka, because there's nothing French about vodka, and put in cognac instead, which I think is very, very cool. Anyway, here's to you, Simon, and here's to you, Keith. It's nice. Not my favourite. I mean, it's a little bit, you know, it's sort of an 80s, 70s thing. But that lovely taste of berry, of tabery comes through. You've got this deep, warm, almost boiled English sweets sort of sweetness to it, which I think is rather nice. Um, and the extra little, little bit of lime really, really makes a big difference. OK, so that's drink number one, the Stinger. Drink number two, the French Martini. Now we're going to show another drink, which, although you might not have seen it on the back of the bar, I could not help but have a look at today. And it's called Liqueur au Piment d'Espelette. Now, Piment d'Espelette is a, is a French chilli. It's a hot pepper. And I think correctly guessing uh, the trend in the increase of spicy drinks and seeing how popular mezcal and tequila were becoming and seeing that chilli was becoming more accessible in all sorts of foods, even sweets, um, they set about trying to make the perfect pepper liqueur. And that's this. So this is actually a spicy liqueur made from Appalachian Contrary peppers. I think Piment d'Espelette are from Provence. I could be very wrong. Um, but um, it's also been made with um, some rum, which is a rum agricole, French rum, which is made from the juice of raw cane sugar. Um, so it's made from the juice rather than molasses, which produces a much more demerara, lifted, more, um, I suppose, more fragrant result. Um, and those rums can age for a very long time. Obviously not in this case, um, but this is uh, made up in Angers in the Loire from those ingredients. Um, what else do we need in order to make uh, my next drink? Well, we need this. Hi, Paul. Told you I'd put your tequila back on the show. This has taken, I think, Britain by storm over the last two years. Vivir Tequila. The gentleman that came uh, makes this now uh, was just trying to make really, really high-energy um, very convenient, um, sort of like for super, super, sort of like Iron Men, triathlete type um, uh, sportsman and elite sportsman. He was trying to produce a kind of a, a, a really high grade Bircher muesli, which is extremely energizing, a very, very healthy breakfast, and was trying to find some non fruit sugars. And of course, tequila is made from 
the agave cactus. And agave syrup is made from fructose, which is far, far better for you than sucrose. So he went out to Mexico to try and find out if he gets some agave syrup to make a much better muesli. Um, by the time he came back, he was so in love with tequila, although he wasn't really a drink before then, that he created his own brand. And this is the Blanco. Um, I picked this up from Waitrose today. Congratulations, Paul, for having a Waitrose listing. This is one of the best tequilas on the market. Although it's a British brand and the packaging, let's be honest, doesn't shout tequila, does it? I think it's quite smart. Again, look at the back bar. What the hell is that? Uh, he has a Reposado, which has a gold top and the colour's quite golden. It's been aged in bourbon casts. Absolutely delicious. And there's another one that's aged even longer called Añejo. I understand there's an Añejo Plus coming. And he more recently um, launched a coffee tequila, um, a bit like Patron XO, although Patron XO is no more. They have stopped production. So that's a very, very big market to fill. Uh, good luck, Paul, with it, because you'll probably be making the best quality one out there. OK, so let's get some ice into my cocktail shaker. Where are we? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is basically make what would be a, a classic margarita. So if I... Pull the bomb on that. Oh dear. This is 50 mils of really good quality Blanco tequila. And this is Vivia Blanco tequila. Currently on offer in Waitrose at the moment. But you're probably paying about 40 for that normally, 37.50 or so. Um, then we put in the lime. Obviously you need lime in a margarita. Usually my um, split is 50 mils um, tequila, uh, 20 mils Lime juice, just checking that's about right. It's usually about half a lime. Yeah, that's about right. And a little bit more. And then about 10 mils of stock syrup, or in this case, agave syrup, which is much sweeter. So we need about five mils. There we go. Now, how do we make this into an interesting cocktail? What we're gonna do is add 25 mils of this delicious liqueur. Okay. You can use this in other ways. There's a, a we, margaritas um, are sort of like our way of drinking tequila in this country. I mean, you think they'd be the same all over the world. It kind of is. But in Mexico, they drink it with pink grapefruit soda, which is called a Paloma. And there's a drink, I believe it's an El Diablo, but I'm not sure if that's a different drink altogether, where you add a little bit of chili to your Paloma and that spice and the coolness of the grapefruit and an ice cold drink and a bar and the heat works magnificently. Okay, here we go. What you want to do is you could use a garnish. Now, round a, normally around the rim of a, of a margarita, you'd use a salt rim. I hate that. This stuff is wonderful. This stuff's called tahine. Uh, I'm not going to do it today because it's just going to get messy. And also I'm serving it on the rocks, not up. Um, so here we've got the glass, which has been pre-chilled with ice in it and I'm going to strain it into that. Let's shake it like we mean it. So here we are. One of the signature drinks of Jafar. This is the spicy margarita. Isn't that refreshing? And delicious. Aren't you jealous? Look at that, it's fantastic. Okay, right. Chin chin. Garnish. Okay. You see, the bell pepper, if you think about chili, chili is a type of red pepper, just like green peppers and red peppers are. Um, they're a capsicum. The flavour of Tequila has this vegetal, capsicum-y, almost cucumbery, avocado-y greenness. Together, they are flipping marvellous. It's almost like chilli in your guac. It just works. And that is, in some ways, in so many ways, better than just a regular tequila margarita. Oh. <laughs> Can't wait to finish that. Let's close this show. OK, right. Um, one more drink. Showing two more products on the back bar, you probably go, what the hell is that for? Well, we're using Maraschino. Maraschino is a, 
if you look at the original um, Italian one, it has this kind of taffeta, it says raffa, raffa, rataffia, yeah, rataffia sort of tape around it, if you like. It's a green bottle and it looks like um, some old folk-like packaging. Um, but there are other good Mariscan liqueurs out there and I just wanted to try Giffa Mariscal. So this is Giffa Mariscal or Mariscina liqueur or cherry liqueur from Giffa in their standard range. See at the top there? Made from Maraschino cherries. I couldn't find any proper Maraschino cherries, but in America, what do they care? They don't really care. They just want it to look right. So I've got myself a cocktail cherry, which is in a fake Maraschino sauce, which will slightly ruin my drink. But if I put that in there, that is the garnish. The garnish is at the bottom. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a lovely drink, though. Where are we? Okay. If I, uh, that to go. I'm just doing a bit of rinsing here. And then I'm going to make us one of my favourite drinks, which is the Aviation. There is a gin out there called Aviation Gin. Uh, made by Ryan Reynolds. Not made by Ryan Reynolds. He bought it. He owns it. Um... Do you know what? I don't care. He's he's just a funny guy. So, yeah, he's allowed. And if it's supposed to be the gin you use in aviation, then fantastic. Um, but I'm using Tankery. They've been using that in aviation since they were invented. And Tankery's older than his gin. So, And it's cheaper. Um, so I'm using this. Uh, absolutely brilliant gin. I know there's hundreds of gins out there. They've all got different qualities. Some of them are absolutely stunning, like Kino B, uh, Dovey Valley Distillery. But this is fine. This is fine for making... Um, an aviation. Okay, right, so I'm using this glass. You should could use a, a martini glass, but in this case, I'm using, I suppose what you call that, it's almost like a Nick and Nola glass, those people who are behind the bar, but it's actually a crystal port glass, a glass I designed for port, works very well, but I do like drinking martinis and drinks like this out of it. Okay, so, what drink am I using? Okay. Oh, this had, uh, had pineapple in it, I don't really want that to spoil the drink, but only one second. <laughs> Pineapple flavoured aviations I don't want to make. Okay, right, so. My bin down there. There we go. So we're looking at for uh, the correct measures. I think we're probably looking at 460 mils of gin. looking at about fifteen mils of lemon juice. Let's go twenty I think. There we go. Then fifteen mils of maraschino liqueur. missing <laughs> and a bar spoon of this you see this on the back bar in many places and i'm a love a lover 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 of this flavor and aroma and um, it, a little bit goes a long way and this is one of the reasons why creme de violette exists i'm just going to put in just a bit more than a bar spoon creme de violette. you can actually ignore <laughs> the violette in, in an aviation i wouldn't dare in fact, what I'd sometimes like to do is make it with the with the maraschino, so it's basically like a gin fix. It's like a, um, a gin and lemon sour, and then you put the violet on top as a float. It looks absolutely beautiful. Okay, right then, where's the other half of this glass? Here we go. Oh, dry shake. I've got to put ice in. <laughs> I'm good at the Santo. Right, okay. Ryan Reynolds, eat your heart out. Beautiful looking drink. You know what? I am going to put a float on it. Just the colour of the colour. Okay. <clears throat> That's Joe Wadsack's very haphazard take 
on the aviation. So what have we learned today? What's on the back bar? Mont Pastille, or you can use a white creme de menthe to make a stinger. That's right, but this is the best of the bunch. There's nothing like this on the market, trust me. If you like mint flavors, this is a lovely thing to drink. Just over ice, frappe at the end of a meal. Then we went on to the French martini. Yes, we had a French martini made with uh, Frombas de Rance or Tabories. Just delicious. It's down there waiting to be drunk. Um, then we made a spicy margarita. Made a regular margarita and then added this um, half as much uh, piment liqueur as there was tequila. So 50 mils of tequila, then you put 25 mil mils of piment. Just reduce the amount of sugar at the end so it didn't taste too sweet and use lime. And it's a regular Tommy's daiquiri, basically. Um, finally, the aviation. So this is the end of What the Hell's on the Back Bar, part one. See you next time. I love that drink. I love this so much. Look at that, isn't that cool? Yeah, it's cool. See you next time. Thank you.